Greetings and welcome to Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. I'm Tammy Denise. In 1995, the Connecticut Freedom Trail was established by the General Assembly to recognize the struggle for freedom and dignity amongst the Black and African American communities. It was established in August of 95 and officially opened in September of 1996 in 50 towns with about 50 sites. Today, we are upwards to 170. Today, we are going to talk about Private Leverett Holden. But before we get to our speaker, a little housekeeping, please remember to fill out our surveys and ask any questions or comments that you may have, put it into our chat, and we will get to as many as we can before the end of the program. Terry Wilson, she has been the president of the Avon Historical Society for the past 15 years. Her presentation today began in 2011 when the 150th commemoration of the U.S. Civil War began in Connecticut. Someone mentioned to her that there was a Connecticut 29th soldier buried in East Avon Cemetery, but that's all that was known, and Terry embarked on a multi-year quest to find out more about him and the Connecticut 29th Regiment. Terry has a bachelor's in politics and Spanish from Eastern Connecticut State College, which is now a university, and a master's in Spanish from Middlebury College. She spent 18 years working for elected state and federal officials, and she later ran a nonprofit in Hartford for 15 years. And now, my friend, who I was an educator and a guide with, Miss Terry Wilson. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Tammy, for that introduction. That was great. Uh, to be fair, I have to say that it was all Tammy's idea that this presentation be entitled The Three Firsts of Private Leverett Holden. When she invited me to tell the story of my research into the Connecticut, Connecticut 29th Regiment and Holden, she noticed that he had three firsts that I had never noticed, so I agreed. So thank you, Tammy, for that. I'm certainly honored to have been chosen to give this presentation during National Freedom Trail Month, and I wish to welcome any of the descendants of the 29th Connecticut who are watching today or later online. It is their ancestors to, who make my research possible and give me a deep history lesson in the making. I am a local historian who loves to connect dots in history, and this research over the past 12 years has done that many times and is still going on today. And I have to thank several people who have led me down this path of discovery into the history of black regiments of our American Civil War. But first I have to set the stage. Who I am and why am I interested in this? For those of you who enjoy research will probably agree that nothing happens by accident. We take the deep dive and events, places and people. And when things pop up, we just go along with them. So let me get my slides started. Okay. Hold on, I have a couple of notes on the side. I just want to make sure I bring up. And okay, who am I and why am I interested in this? So it kind of started 53 years ago when I was 10 years old and I had a book report to do on Frederick Douglass. Back then, all we had was encyclopedias for research. And I remember seeing his photo and thinking that he really looked like a nice man. I read the book, I did the report, and I even used an overhead projector to trace his photo for the front cover. And I believe I received a really good grade for that. But let me fast forward about 14 years later to around 1985, when I was already out of college and I was living at home in Simsbury, I joined the Simsbury Historical Society. And someone on the board of directors had told us all that they had met a man by the name of John Motley, who offered to show us his incredible collection of all things related to blacks in the military. Now, if I recall this all correctly, he lived a few towns away and was in corporate leadership at Travelers Insurance. I remember distinctly visiting his home and being able to hold chains, shackles, neck irons that enslaved people wore while they were being held by their captors. He had broadsides announcing the selling of enslaved, military memorabilia from the Civil War through the Vietnam War. It was an amazing and humbling and something that I has never, ever left my mind. Fast forward another 26 years to 2011. I had already moved to Avon and became the president of the Historical Society. And the, this, the sesquicentennial of the Civil War commemoration started uh, in Connecticut in 2000. Um, the 150th. The society was in partnership with the Avon Free Public Library for the commemoration. So we planned a lot of events and book talks and all sorts of things. Our local library at that time was undergoing a major renovation. 
And the local library director called me and asked me because she was moving some books from one room to the other. She called me to ask if we knew that we had a black Civil War soldier who was buried in Avon. I replied that I did not, but I would certainly find out. Shortly thereafter, about two weeks later, I went to a commemoration event somewhere in Connecticut, I can't remember, where it was mentioned that Reverend James Pennington, who I knew was kind of like the Frederick Douglass, gave a speech in Hartford in the 1850s that may have been a turning point for Connecticut in some way. So to make a long story short, by 2012, I knew about Private Leverett Holden's grave in the East Avon Cemetery, which just happens to be a three minute walk from my house in the center of Avon today. It is located behind the Avon Congregational Church at the major intersections of Route 10 and 44 in what is the true and historic center of Avon. Like I said before, and many historians know this, nothing is by accident. I was meant to experience all of this. Before I start with my research, I need to let you know that I might jump around a bit, and that's only because, as you know, one path leads into another, and so do discoveries that make it all come together. So uh, Pennington, as I had mentioned, um, we, we know that uh, he was um, received his um, ministry from Yale University and then just very recently was granted um, a master's degree at Yale a couple of weeks ago in a grand celebration. Um, he was the minister uh, of, the, of the Talcott Street Congregational Church, which was at 30 Talcott Street, built in 1826. Uh, the site right now is a parking garage area. Uh, he was pastor there from 1840 to 1847. Uh, he was a freedom seeker, uh, the ordained minister in 1837. And uh, he then moved to New York City after he was done with in Connecticut, but returned to Hartford many times to preach and support abolitionist efforts here. Now it's to remember, England abolished slavery in 1833 and could have been the impetus for much of the early abolitionist movements here. Uh, so on August 1st of 1856, five years before the Civil War started, African-Americans in Hartford held a celebration of abolition of, of slavery at Gillette's Grove, which is known to be an area near where Etna and the Mark Twain House is today. Pastor Pennington was the lead speaker. Many black people attended this and began to understand the need for abolition of their brothers and sisters in the South. My question was, when I started the research on Leverett Holden, could he have been at the celebration? And if he did, what influence did it have on him for joining the Civil War later on? Now remember, that was in 1856. The congregation of the Talcott Street Congregational Church moved uh, to 2030 Main Street and built this church, Faith Congregational Church, which still stands today. My apologies to historians of the Civil War. This is the briefest history of the Civil War ever. Uh, as we know, Fort Sumter fell in South Carolina in April of 1861. President Lincoln called up the troops. It was thought to be maybe just a brief skirmish that would last only three months. That skirmish became a full-out war between the North and the South, brother against brother. Uh, it turns out Ohio was the first state to attempt to raise a Black regiment in early of 1862. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation officially started January 1st of 1863, with subsequent congressional approval in early of 1864. The proclamation allowed President Lincoln to re recruit colored troops, that's what they're called, for the first time in early 1863. The 54th Massachusetts formed early in July of 1863. Most colored troops from many northern states formed immediately, including our Connecticut 29th uh, in August of 1863, just 160 years ago. Some early regiments formed in New Orleans, but that history is certainly not told in the North, and that's for research at another time. Again, um, my apologies to Connecticut historians. This is the briefest history of Connecticut in the Civil War. At first, our General Assembly voted not to enter the war as many legislators did not think it was a worthy effort or that it was ours to join. Governor Buckingham, who was a close friend of Abraham Lincoln's and believed in this cause, prevailed raising $810,000 from banks and wealthy individuals, using his assets as collateral to pay for the first and second white regiments to be formed and outfitted in May of 1861. The General Assembly later voted to form regiments with about 900 men in each for a total of 28 regiments of white soldiers. The major battles that Connecticut men fought in, of course, were like Antietam, 
in September of 62 and Gettysburg in July of 63. Here is a broadside um, or enlistment poster uh, for Connecticut from May of 1861. And two years later, by December of 1863, here is how the um, call went out to black, black men to join the Connecticut 29th. Um, I'm just pointing out the, the size difference and also what they said. These are all from the, Connect, the Hartford Daily Current. This is an enlistment poster from December of 1863 from Camden, New Jersey. So you can see what they said and how they said that. What is the Connecticut 29th Regiment? Well, as I said, Governor Buckingham created it in August of 1863. So it just had 160th anniversary. According to an 1867 book by J.J. Hill, who served in the regiment, those who volunteered were promised a bounty of $310 from the state $75 from the county they came from, and $300 from the U.S. government. He states that they only received $310 from the state. This is in contrast to a book 58 years later in 1923 by Reverend A.H. Newton, who also served in the 29th. He stated that they were promised only $15 upon enlistment, but never received it. And the only reason I share this is because these are the only two books written by soldiers who served in the 29th. So we have firsthand accounts from them. So after filling the ranks of the 29th Connecticut with approximately 900 men, a 30th Connecticut regiment was formed very early in 1864 with only a few hundred. During the, during the service in the war, the 29th Connecticut lost 44 enlisted and 152 died of disease for a total of not 196 of the almost 900 who were in the regiment. Among most of the northern states, over 200,000 black men fought in the Civil War. Over time, at least 100 of them became officers. For the most part, black regiments were granted pensions, if requested, equal to their white counterparts. Now, it should be noted that the Connecticut 29th and the Mass 54th were the only black troops to retain their status as a state regiment upon their return. All other state black troops were eventually merged into what is called U.S. Colored Troops, USCT, and they were given numbers by the federal government. For example, the 30th Connecticut became the U.S. 31st Infantry Colored Troops. So many USCT were freedom seekers who either escaped to join the Union or were from free states that didn't have a formal state regiment. But we're very proud that the 29th and the Mass and the 54th from Massachusetts retained theirs. And of course, if you've seen the movie Glory, that is about the 54th Massachusetts. So I started getting, after I learned all of that, I started getting into who was Private Leverett Holden. So I went right to his, um, his enlistment papers. He enlisted into Company D on December 15th of 1863. He stated he was born in Vernon, Connecticut, 38 years old, making him born in 1825. He stated he was five foot eight in height, had a colored complexion, black hair, and black eyes. He told them his occupation was that of a farmer, and later records show that he was illiterate, as many of them were. So I wanted to know if he really was born in Vernon. So I actually um, went to the State Library and went to look up the 1820 census, showing that there was a George Holden, a black man, head of household with six family members in Vernon, Connecticut. Could this have been his father? I don't know because names of other household members were not listed until the 1850 census, so we're not gonna be sure. And the Barber collection at the Connecticut State Library does not show a birth or baptism record for a Leverett Holden in Vernon in the 1820s. So his actual birth date and location are not confirmed. And I need to thank Kevin Johnson of the Connecticut State Library who helped me do this research. And for those of you who don't know or might know, Kevin Johnson is a portrayer of William Webb, who was a Connecticut 29th soldier, just happens to be from Ver happened to be from Vernon as well. And he brings him to life. And I'm going to bring that up in a few more minutes. Here is a copy from the full three website of Leverett Holden's enlistment uh, papers. And you can see where he says his age and his height, his complexion, his eyes uh, listed as a farmer. So this would have made him born in 1825, but this is disputed later on and you'll find out why. This is where it gets interesting. So going back to my 10 year old crush on Frederick Douglass, 
uh, found out that he spoke to the 29th Connecticut in Fairhaven before they took off to join. It was on January 29th of 1864. The article on the left is from the Waymark, which was a newspaper in New Haven. And it talks about uh, Douglas coming to town to speak. And the most famous line out of that speech that still exists today is, you are pioneers of the liberty of your race. Not all powers of darkness can prevent you from becoming American citizens. I would assume that Leverett Holden was at that site at that time and, and heard him speak. So let me go back again. This is where we have to kind of jump back and forth. The U.S. Census of 1850 has a Leverett Holden living with the Wadsworth family on Prospect Hill in Hartford. He's listed as age 26, which would make him born in 1824, not 1825, or as you're going to find out later, 1821. He was a member of the household along with many others, which could mean he was either a servant or a stable hand, a laborer, maybe a farmer, I don't know. Um, I wanted to know if this house still exists. And this is when one of those aha moments happens when you do history and you get excited. It turns out that this house is the oldest house in the West End of Hartford today. It's the Elijah Wadsworth house. The address today is 1234 Prospect Avenue, which is on the corner of Albany Avenue. It was built in 1828. According to the Hartford Preservation Alliance, at that time it was built, one could stand on the top of the hill and see open land and farmhouses stretching east all the way to central Hartford and the Connecticut River. In 1919, this brick mansion was turned 90 degrees to face Prospect Avenue. The Wadsworth family operated an inn in this house until 1862, just a year after the Civil War started. Now, very recent research tells us that Leverett Holden moved to Avon in the mid 1850s. His motive for moving west is unknown. For those of you who might live in, in this area of Hart, and live around Hartford, um, where is my cursor? There we go. Um, I will show you the house today. This is what it looked like when Leverett worked there. It was uh, facing Albany Avenue and had a nice big front porch. Today, it is this house. It is 1234 Prospect Avenue after it was turned in 1919. Now, if you are from this area and if you are traveling east on Albany Avenue coming out of Bishop's Corner in West Hartford, in West Hartford and going towards Hartford, you, you kind of climb up a hill and when you get to the top of the hill, there is a light and this is right before you go down the hill where the road splits and you can go left to go to University of Hartford or right to go to Hartford. Um, this is, this is the house that's on at that light. And if you're at that light, just look to the right and there it is looking at you. Imagine my, my, um, my surprise when I discovered that for 30 years, I went that way into Hartford to work um, and I went right by that house every single day and coming out every day. So when I found out that this was the house that Leverett more than likely worked in because he was in the census records, I had to get a picture and I had to go up to the house and touch it. I know that sounds weird, but when you're doing this and you don't have much tangible about, about a person you're researching to be able to see and, and touch the side of the house of where they worked, it was, it was quite amazing. His military service, the Connecticut, the 29th Connecticut mustered out in March, mustered in March 18th, no, nope, March 8th, sorry, 1864, and they served in six major battles. Now, records show that Holden was ill from September to November of 1864 and treated at a 10 or X Corps flying hospital, kind of like a mass unit, it moved around after the siege of Petersburg, Virginia. These kind of hospitals treated both black and white units. Now, another interesting thing happened. While I was reading about this particular hospital at this particular time, there was a mention of Clara Barton, who we now know is the founder of the US Red Cross. She was stationed at that same hospital as a dietitian and nurse at the same time. Possibly she treated Private Holden. We don't know, but I'd like to think so. The 29th Connecticut was the first unit to enter the burning city of Richmond on April 3rd of 1865. And they, they saw President Lincoln when he visited it. I'd like to think that he was, that Private Holden was there as well. The 29th officially mustered out on October 24th of 1865 at Brownsville, Texas. He was honorably discharged in New Haven a, a month later. Records show he was paid $78.40 for his clothing allowance, six for his arms, and was owed 100 by the government as his bounty for joining. He did not apply for a pension. 
you can see that those numbers are quite different than Newton and Hill. This is the only known photo of the Connecticut 29th taken at Beaufort, South Carolina in April 64. This is a photo from the Library of Congress. And I have to say it is a much longer photo going off to the left into the distance are all of the soldiers lined up. So I just did a, a, I just did a zoom in so that I could show you a little more up close what it looks like. But this is the only photo known uh, of, the, of the 29th Connecticut. We recently found out that by the mid 1850s, Lev, as a local resident referred to him in his diary, was living in Avon, but he's not recorded in the 1860 census. Um, so we don't, I, I, I don't really understand that, but he probably just wasn't around when the census taker was here or, or whatever. But um, in the 1870 census of Avon, so this is after the Civil War, he appears living with a Martha Williams, a mulatto woman keeping house. He stated his age as 49, which would put his birth at 1821. But if you recall, his enlistment was listed as at his birth year as 1825. Now, here's another piece of interesting history that happened, and this was another aha. They lived in West, on West Avon Road, which is Route 167, at what is now the 1810 Darren House, which just happens to be a house leased to the Avon Historical Society by the State Military Department. And here is a picture of the house today. Uh, Leverett lived on or next to this property. We don't know for sure, but, but at this time in the early uh, or in the mid 1800s, the Darrens owned quite a lot of property. This house is still standing. We're working to, uh, we're hopefully going to be able to paint the exterior of it this, this coming weekend. We'd like, we, we were going to open it as a museum in, two, in 2016, but it suffered a fire one month prior. Uh, we've had to shore it up and we're going to be doing something with it, I believe, in 2024. But oddly enough, house we've been working in could be the same house that Leverett was living in um, after the Civil War. Another incredible coincidence when, you, when you're doing research. From a one-line notation in the November 14th, 1869 ledger of the Avon Congregational Church, we find the following. To L. Holden for cleaning brick, $1.75. The church was undergoing a cleaning of their chimney and it appears Leverett was paid to be part of that project. How do we know? Coincidentally, the minister of the church at that time was Reverend Henry G. Marshall, who served as captain, a white captain, in the 29th Connecticut. We can only assume he knew Leverett and most likely hired him. And another reference in a family diary has him cutting and stacking wood for a family in the center of Avon. And finally, recently, we just found in the Avon town records Private Leverett Holden died in Avon on October 11th of 1877, age 56, which puts his birth year at 1821, not 1825, single and a laborer. There's no mention of how he died. So as expected, he is not in the 1880 census of Avon. We just wanted to make sure of that. So I went through that. So we said there were three firsts. Here is his first first. Private Holden's grave site, stone is, now, is in what we, it was then called Avon Cemetery. It was found on the map from the Hale Collection of October 8, 1934, as being in the back row far away from other graves. It appears he's the last grave in the cemetery, very well segregated. Today, due to a change in the 1940s configuration of the entrance of the cemetery, which is now on Simsbury Road, which is Route 10, Private Holden's grave is number one in row one, still segregated from everybody else, but well noticed by anyone who enters the cemetery. So this is his first first. Leverett Holden, who we have no image of, was from Vernon, Connecticut. He never married, so there's no descendants. He's a Civil War hero who made Avon his home and the Avon Historical Society honors him every year with a flag and a medallion. As you saw on the opening slide um, is this picture. And if you see in the back, you notice back in here, there is a stone. That is as far away as he is from everybody else's stones in the cemetery. So it is a large open area. This is uh, an official Union soldier gravestone made in the 1930s. It is not the typical Civil War uh, small limestone uh, headstone that was usually used um, right after the Civil War. And you'll notice we put a GAR medallion, Grand Army of the Republic a medallion with a U.S. flag on that, and that flies from Memorial Day through Veterans Day. His second first, 
Um, I'm gonna, in a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about the monument in New Haven, but I just want to point out to you the photos of this monument in New Haven to the 29th. This is the center obelisk and around it are the names of all the 900 men and the very first name on the very first stone because it's alphabetical for the town of Avon being first is Private Leverett Holden, Company D. So this is his second first, he's first on the monument. His third, due to his status as a private in the 29th Connecticut and as a freedom seeker, his grave site was named the 164th site on the Connecticut Freedom Trail just this past February. This is his third first. So he is now the first grave in the Avon uh, Center Cemetery, first name on the monument in New Haven, and the first to be named on the Connecticut Freedom Trail in the town of Avon. Those are his three firsts. So if you wanna learn more about the Connecticut 29th, uh, I really encourage you to go to New Haven because in 2008, the descendants of the 29th erected a monument to their ancestors on the spot where they departed aboard ship in the Fairhaven section. This is where they also met with and heard from Fre uh, Frederick Douglass. The site is now Chris School Park. It's on the corner of James and Chapel Street. There's still a remnant of the railroad track on the street going into the park, which probably carried some of the 900 freedom seekers to this spot. It's worth a visit to see the names and read the regiment's story. It also turns out that Leverett's name appears on a monument outside the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC. So during the sesquicentennial commemoration, um, we had uh, both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln join descendants of the 29th at the monument in New Haven uh, in 2013. The Frederick Douglass is uh, my friend, Michael Crutcher, who's from Kentucky. He is a uh, national, uh, he travels nationally as Frederick Douglass. He was also the model for the statue of Frederick Douglass that's in the United States Capitol. And our Abraham Lincoln on the right is Howard Wright, who is from Canton, Connecticut, and uh, is one of the many portrayers of Abraham Lincoln around the country, but we think he's the best because he's here in Connecticut. And they were both happy to come down and meet with some of the descendants and tour the, the monument. Uh, you can see it was a rainy day, but the New Haven Register came out and they did a story on it. And it was really a rather interesting day and uh, very poignant to, to think about that. Um, the African American Civil War Museum, if you haven't been, is in on Vermont Avenue in, in uh, Washington. This is not the main one on the mall. This is away from the mall. As you can see outside in the middle of the street is a large statue and all around it in this big air, in this area all around are all the names of over 200,000 men uh, who served in the Civil War. And we did find Leverett Holden's name and it's pointed out there, not first, but certainly amongst all of them. So it was just great to be able to see that there. And if you ever get a chance to go to Washington and see that museum, it is spectacular. And you know that picture of the 29th Connecticut from Buford, South Carolina, that is the size of a wall. They blew it up huge. I couldn't believe it when we walked in and saw a whole wall with the Connecticut 29th on it. It was really fabulous to see. Little postscript, records show that some of the black regiments from Connecticut and other states had soldiers who joined that did not live in the states where they enlisted. Some returned to other states after the war. Therefore, we do know that not all 900 men in the 29th or the 30th were from Connecticut. And you probably noticed when I pointed out Leverett's name on the monument in New Haven that there's two names under it from Avon, Joseph McFarland and Henry Williams. We don't have any records of them living in Avon prior to their enlistment. Joseph McFarland, we found out deserted, and Henry Williams, we can't find after the war at all. So I don't, I, I'm fairly sure that they had nothing to do with Avon. They may have just come here for their enlistment. Maybe they were in town or, or something. We don't know. But um, Leverett, we do know, was living here and, uh, and then passed away here. So how did we commemorate Private Holden and the 29th in, in Avon? Well, um, we recognize their contribution to the Civil War during the sesquicentennial with a special exhibit entitled, what else? Pioneers of the Liberty of Your Race at the Avon Free Public Library during Black History Month in February and March of 2014. Uh, a special ceremony to rededicate the grave of Private Holden took place on Saturday, February 22nd, 2014 with descendants of several of the 29th soldiers we used the GAR ceremony, the Grand Army of the Republic ceremony of 1919 
There, it, there were speeches given inside the church afterwards about the regiment and the story of the experience. And of course, Kevin Johnson, who I mentioned earlier, sung us into the church as Private William Webb, who just happened to be from Vernon, where Levert was from. And Today Magazine is a local online magazine in the Farmington Valley here, and they published an article about Private Holden in their February issues in 2020 and 2021 for Black History Month. And I believe I have a picture here. Uh, this was the rededication of the grave. Um, if you're the first five here on the left are all descendants of 29th, uh, the 29th Regiment. And then this is Kevin Johnson from the State Library who portrays William Webb. And if you notice, there's a flag here, a Connecticut Volunteers, it says on it, but it actually says 29th Regiment Volunteers. And this is a replica of the original regimental flag, which I'll get to in a minute. Here's Leverett's grave. Just notice how close he is to the fence line here, and there's a sidewalk in front of that fence. Um, that'll come up later. So because of questions about the placement of Private Holden's gravestone and the seemingly open area around him, it's beginning to suggest that there are unmarked graves there. So the East Avon Cemetery Association submitted a grant to the State Historic Preservation Office just a few weeks ago to have a ground penetrating radar done in that segregated area to determine if in fact he is there or are there other unmarked graves. So there is more to come with this story. The regimental flag of the Connecticut 29th. Um, many of you may know that the Connecticut State Capitol was built by uh, in 1887 and was dedicated as a monument to the US Civil War by many Civil War veterans who were involved in it. A hall of flags on the first floor uh, was dedicated and put on display with a grand ceremony of all regimental flags from all the units except the 29th Connecticut. During the sesquicentennial celebration, it was pointed out to me that the 29th flag was missing. So I went digging with um, Matt Warshower, who was the co-chair of the sesquicentennial, and we discovered that the Connecticut 29th flag was stored in the cellar of the Capitol. So we organized an event. On May 1st in 2015, their flag was brought up from storage in the cellar to be on permanent display along the walkway between the Capitol and the Legislative Office building. It was a large event with several speakers and, and of course, descendants of the 29th. So on the left here is a picture of that original flag right there that you see with many descendants in attendance. Uh, Frederick Douglass came up from Kentucky and spoke. And also um, we had with us John Motley, and this is me with John Motley, uh, whose vast collection I talked about earlier with all things related to Blacks in the military really inspired a lot of what I do. Much of his collection is now at the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia, the Amistad Center in Hartford, the Ohio Historical Society, and the West Point Military Academy. Now, some of you may be wondering where the rest of the flag is, because what you see here is just a remnant, and that is because many of the men took pieces of their flag, and so what was left was really the number 29th, and then Connecticut, and you'll see it up close in a minute, but I just want to point that out. The flag was made by a company in New York State, the descendants about 15 years ago contacted that company, which is still a flag making company and had reproductions of the flag made and they still had the records from having made that flag. So the one that you saw in the picture before in the cemetery was the reproduction flag. So they use them when they're at events. Here is the original that you just saw. It is now on permanent display. If you're in our state capitol and you are on the first floor and you take the escalator down to go to the to the bottom to walk through the underground to the legislative office building as soon as you get down that escalator if you turn right there's an alcove area that is set aside just for this flag and this uh, plaque to go with it uh, commemorating the connecticut 29th and the 30th regiments Uh, these are the references that I used during my research. I did go through books and, and diaries and directories and census records, and you can see there's quite a lot here. Um, it took some time. It took many years to do this, and I'm still adding to it since we have this new information that might be happening. If we do get some ground penetrating radar in the cemetery, it may change our story altogether. And I have one last thing to share with you. Um, this is the forlorn soldier. If you're in our state capitol and you're on the first floor, you may run across this gentleman. This has been was permanently placed on display in the capitol on September 17th of 2013 
on the 152nd anniversary of the Battle of Antietam, uh, the worst day in American history, most casualties that we ever suffered on American soil. This statue was made by the James Batterson Stoneworks in Hartford. James Batterson, who became the president of Travelers Insurance Company, um, was, a, was a big supporter um, of the Union during the Civil War. And prior to the Civil War, most statues were obelisks. They were square obelisks, kind of like the Washington Monument uh, in DC. And he thought maybe we should create a soldier as a statue in honor of the people who served. Uh, this, um, it's a long story behind this soldier that for another time, but let's just put it this way. This was a beginning of what later became Batterson's famous statues um, of soldiers that are in battlefields and in places all over the country. You may see them, but this was a cast aside, probably first version. Um, he was called forlorn. He doesn't have a face or arms because he went through an awful lot. There's quite a lot you could read about him, what happened to this statue. Um, but it turns out that prior to placing him in 2013, it was around two, 2012, when I contacted um, the Sesquicentennial Commission, and again, Matt Warshower, the co-chair, and I said to him, you know, I'm looking at this statue called the Forlorn Statue in Hartford underneath Route 91 on some MDC property. And to make a long story short, it looked like he was going to become toppled over by the machinery that was around there. And I said, we really need to do something about this. So Matt worked with the owner of the statue and was able to get him not restored, but shored up and brought into the Capitol. And he's now on permanent display. And I'm really proud to say that that, that was a very big effort, just like bringing up the flag was, just like all of these com commemoration events were but something that was very important to make sure that we keep telling the story of what happened during the Civil War and the amount of effort that Connecticut men and businesses and families went through uh, during that time. And we don't want to forget that. And what an appropriate place to put the forlorn statue, soldier, but in the state capitol with all the other Civil War memorabilia that is there. So I'm really pleased with that, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. So if you have any questions or, or have more information to share, please contact me. Uh, here's my personal email and my phone number. Um, I am doing this as a kind of a private individual, but I am president of the Historical Society. So the society is certainly aware of what is happening here. And I think that that is about it. So I'm at the end. I did my best for 45 minutes. I think I got to 40, Tammy. <laughs> You're fine, Terry. Thank you so much. Um, great presentation. I'm looking forward to all of the updates because there's more um, information and exciting information coming out about the 29th. And there's also um, more research that you're doing for private Leverett Holden. I do appreciate um, your dedication and your time for trying to make sure this man gets the honor he deserves. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have a couple of comments here. Andre says, I love that house. I pass by it often as I am from the Bloomfield area. I drive by it when I leave Hartford and drive down Prospect to get to my family's home. And like you, passing that house for many years, did not know the historical significance until we actually talked. So thank you for bringing that to my attention as well. Um, there's another question that says, um, his first for the cemetery. Is that because he is now number one in the reconfigured cemetery? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly right. He's now reconfigured. Now he's in, he is grave one, row one in the cemetery. Oh, nice. Yep. Now, um, also, I think this was answered, but it said, why is he the first to be named on the monument? Is that because Avon's the first town? Yes. It just yeah. happened to be alphabetical just by chance. And I think, Tammy, when you reviewed my slides you're the one that came up with the idea hey he's got one two three first what's what why don't we just yeah. call it three first? Can, <laughs> I I go, that. can i go back to the house on uh, prospect for a second um i also want to let everybody know that if if you're not aware at the very southern side end of that street if you if you turn right onto prospect or left onto prospect off you just go straight ahead on the same side as this as this house is at the very end is the governor's mansion yes yes it is um, thank you. Nora says, thank you, Terry, for this fascinating and detailed story about Leverett Holden. I'm amazed the flag making company still had the CT 29th flag design and could replicate the flag. That is awesome that they have that. Um, Carolyn says, very well done. I love these deep dives into the lives of individual soldiers. Jose, Private Leverett Holden and all the gallant men of the 29th Connecticut. Thank you, Terry, for a wonderful program. 
Uh, Deb Key says, Terry, thank you for sharing this research to tell Leverett's story. Your fascination to learn more over many years is intriguing. So you have a lot of support and a lot of appreciation <laughs> for your hard work. Because as you know, as historians, when we make those deep dives, it takes us down rabbit holes and we find all sorts of connections that we weren't looking for. And then sometimes when you find those particular connections, it can lead you from your the, the direction of your original project. And then it's days and weeks later, sometimes years later, you realize, wait, my original point was to go this way. Right. I remember I went to the state library once and when I went in, the sun was still shining. When I came out, it was dark. And it and it was like, whoa, was I really in there that long? So, you know, when we get on our yeah. little research missions, these things yeah. can definitely take us far and wide. And it's so mm -hmm. amazing to me how when we're digging up this history, it seems so vibrant and so alive. And you wonder, how in the world did this get lost? How did it get right. misplaced? Right. And you wonder, because it's such great information. But I love that Kevin Johnson does what he does. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to bring this history to life. Mm -hmm. So that people can understand they were real human beings. They weren't just facts and figures. That's so, right. And these were the regular guys. I mean, yes. William Webb, his, his story of William Webb is amazing because William yes. Webb, like Leverett, grew up in Vernon, crazy guys, crazy kids. We know William <laughs> Webb was arrested. He had so he had some. Then he joined the, the Civil War and, and you know, became a hero later. Leverett was probably just a common young man who worked his way up, found himself at the Wadsworth Tavern and then somehow just came five miles west over Avon Mountain and down into Avon and boom, he's here. And, uh, but those connections and those coincidences that happen along the way when yeah. you're doing this research, like, you know, like the minister of the church being the Connecticut 29th minister, being at the, living at the Darren House property. I never knew any of that until we got into this and it was like, wow, aha moments. This is crazy. Um, I love those historical connections. I love them. Yep. And I often wonder, you know, a hundred years from now when people are researching us and things, <laughs> what kind of historical connections will they make with the people that exist yeah. today? You know, I often um, think of that. And I love when I'm doing research, finding those historical connections. Because sometimes when you think about history, you think about it being so far off and so out of touch. And then when you start researching and then you realize, wait, they lived in the same community. They had to interact. Now you're wondering, can I find something that actually proves that they interacted or they knew each other? And then I often say, do we really need those tangible connections? Because it's common, you know, it's just, if you think about it, the communities were not as large as they are today. And I'm sure they had some kind of connections with different oh. individuals, even if it was just a passing by, hey, how you doing type scenario. But, oh. it, you know, those historical connections are very important. So, Terry, what's um, going on next with Private Holden? I know that uh, we, we touched on it a while ago about not necessarily that his grave site may not be actually right. where it should be. So right. where exactly is that in the scheme of things? And what are you hoping that that will bring to fruition for you? Right. So the East Avon Cemetery Association, which owns the property behind the Avon Congregational Church, where he his stone is located, has applied to the State Historic Preservation Office for a grant. That grant is going to be voted on, I believe, next week. If the if the money is made available, then there will be a company hired to do some ground penetrating radar on the space behind his, in front of his grave and behind his grave to where the other graves are located. It's maybe, um, I think it's a, a 50 by 25 foot area. And it's an odd area because we can't, the, the historian of the church, Nora Howard, who was one of your people who wrote in, who chimed in a few minutes ago, she's done a pretty big research on that plot of land and nothing really has ever been there. So we're wondering, could that have been a site where unmarked graves are of either maybe black and indigenous people, paupers, just people who didn't have anybody else. And if that's the case, why would Leverett stone in the 1930s be placed there? Why wasn't there a stone there earlier? Maybe mm -hmm. there was a typical so, uh, civil war stone, which is a smaller limestone stone that would just have a name on it. Uh, we don't know. But that stone um, was identified, the one that I showed you was identified as a 1930s-ish version of a Union soldier st stone with a death date on it, which is what the other original ones did not have. 
Um, so they use the town records to put that together. So we're hoping that ground penetrating radar will show whether there are possible burials, possible people there, and then we can determine that. Now, I did show in one of the pictures that his stone is located very close to a fence line. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that fence line is a sidewalk. And then after the sidewalk is the street. Okay. Unfortunately, we know a lot of black burials could be under streets and under sidewalks. Um, unlikely here because it's a little bit of a rise over the road itself. So don't know that for sure. That's why the ground penetrating radar will help. It may not tell us anything. And if it shows that nobody's there, then that's really an honorary stone. And we would, we don't know, but, um, you know, we will we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it actually. Cause so there could be somebody, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, so many, um, African-American burial grounds are on the parking lots and, um, super supermarkets and um, yep. condos and things of that sort. And that's valuable information in history that has been lost and we may never find it, may never know. So if the ground penetration shows that, will there be another ceremony to reinter um, Private Leverett if it's proven that he's there or? I would very much like to have another ceremony. Absolutely. That's what we were going to do this past weekend, but canceled it because we weren't so sure. So I am glad we canceled the ceremony that we originally had for this month because you yeah. had asked me to do that. But I'm glad that we talked earlier and I explained the situation because I would rather be correct than be just guessing. Yes. So once we have this gathered and the radar is done and we know whether or not there are graves there or a grave there, which could be his, then, of course, we can certainly do a, a, some kind of an honorary or a dedication uh, on the Freedom Trail for his site. Um, yeah. Or maybe there's going to be others. I don't know. So, like I said, we'll we'll absolutely plan something. And it doesn't have to be during this month, of course. We can do it right. anytime. Okay. It's right down here. But what's really cool is I take an early morning walk um, and I go right by his grave every single day. And I have for years, but I didn't know until 2011 that that's who he was. So it's kind of fun. I say good morning to him every time I walk by just because I know, you know, when you get into history, you, just, you, you think, you know, what these, who these people are. And I you kind of become friends with them, even though I don't know what he looked like. I, except I knew he was five, eight and, and he was a black man. And that's all I know. Well, those hidden treasures in plain sight <laughs> are some of the best treasures to find. Right. And it's okay. beautiful when we can bring them to the fort, even though they're still hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. It helps the public to start to look for these treasures, to mm -hmm. see them more. And that goes in harmony with what Deb Key just said. She said now she wants to learn more about Leverett and his comrades <laughs> in arms to understand their lives before, during, and after the Civil War. And she says these stories have great resonance for our times too. And you're right, Deb, they really do because it helps us to get in touch with who we really are as a group of people, not as individual communities, but as a whole group and how all of the stories, once they're told, I like to tell everybody, when you look at this country, if you're looking down on it as a puzzle, it has all these great milestones and events, mm -hmm. but yet along the way, there are missing puzzle pieces because all of the stories are not included or told. So once you people like yourself and other historians and researchers, when we start finding this information out and we flesh these stories out and connect them to that whole story, it definitely resonates resonates with today. It's not just something that's in the past. So again, I thank you. Um, Nora, thank you very much for your support. And um, yes, we appreciate you being here and hope that you will come and join us each um, month that we do our presentation at Conversations at Noon. We try to do a diverse subject each time. We try to have varying individuals on. So please join us again next month. Well, Terry, I appreciate you being here and sharing this great research. It's like old times when we used to get together and, and discuss <laughs> um, lesson plans and how we were going to do our wow. tours. So thank you so very much for being here today. It is an honor to um, do this work with you. And I look forward to our next conversation when you are, have this information updated. So I have to have you come back. Thank you so very much, Terry. You're for welcome. our next upcoming programs, um, Tuesday, October 24th at noon, we have the making of the first Black U.S. diplomat with William Fothergill. Tuesday, November 28th at noon, we have Sleeping with the Ancestors, the Educational Value of Sleeping in Slave Dwellings with Mr. Joseph McGill. And then December 12th, can't believe it, we are going to be doing another year in review with myself, the chairman and the coordinator, Todd Levine. So thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us today. 
please feel free to complete the survey. Let us know how we're doing and let us know of other topics that you may want to hear in regards to the history here in Connecticut. Thank you so very much again, everyone. And until the next time. Bye.